Namaste, good morning, Jule, Vanakam, Namaskaram, Namaskar, and so many other ways that we've done this. And viewers, thanks for supporting us. I always say that, but today I'm going to say it specially because today, as we unroll this episode, this very special episode, in fact, it is the hundredth episode in the series of Dekho Apna Desh. And my heart felt thanks to all the presenters who've joined with us when we started on 14th April, 2020, as pandemic kind of sort of was not just staring at us, but was making us sit at our homes, not really knowing what to do. I think we were all really wondering how long it will last. Who would have thought that even as we talk today in September, 2021, significant part of the world still remains closed. So that was the kind of adversity the world was going to face. None of us could have known that in April, 2020. But yes, the spirit of human resilience, the ability to come on the top of things and to think through adversity is something that has defined humanity over centuries and millennia. And so surely this will also be behind us. But in the process from the Ministry of Tourism, we all thought, what is it that we really can do to add value to the whole space of tourism, not just for Indians themselves, but for our friends all over the world who could then plan their travels to come to India in times to come. Now, you would all know that because of various reasons put together, because perhaps sometimes there was lack of connectivity, perhaps there was lack of information, etc., etc. So much more has opened up in India over the last so many years. But the focus was not going to a lot of efforts that people have been doing in their own little areas, whether it was about integrating a cultural thing, it was a dance form, it could be music, it could be just a homestay, it could have been some embroidery, some bead making, metal work, foods, and there was just so much that we felt that the world didn't know about India as much as it should know about India. And that was one of the sentiments and themes that set us on this road of the journey of discovering incredible India, where we said, let's try and focus on the lesser known places as much as we can. In the process, of course, we have taken you to the more known places also, because not everybody knows those known places too. And even in the known places, a lot has happened. Government and private initiatives have added a lot of value to these places. So that's the other reason why we did bring you some of the more known places too. And of course, they are a matter of great pride for us. They do draw a lot of tourists, not just from India, but from all over the world. So it's been an incredible journey of 100 today being the 100th episode. And I want to thank and also thank all my team members, everyone in the ministry who has worked tirelessly to create and keep creating these episodes. Because when we started, we were all not so sure how many episodes would we really be able to do and how many would we be able to sustain interest in. And I'm very happy to share that over the period of last year and a half, we have had more than people from 60 plus countries actually joining in. People joining in even live at orders of ours from their countries, even though we have sometimes been telling them hey, it's available as a recording on the Ministry of Tourism's website. You can always see it later. He said, no, 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 there's something about watching it live. So thank you viewers like these. You are the ones who really drive us. You are the ones who keep our passion alive. And therefore we are going to keep bringing you many more such episodes. We might rethink, we might rejig them. We might want to present them a bit differently because we're getting a lot of feedback. We're also getting a lot of inputs. We are getting a lot of thoughts on the various things that are required to be done as we go along. A lot of new focus areas have also come forward. So a lot is going to keep happening. Therefore, don't leave us. Keep tuned in every Saturday, maybe. It might go for a change, but as of now, Saturday. Next week, we are going to take a break. So I'm not going to say at the end of this episode that we're going to meet you again next Saturday. No, we will not meet you next Saturday. We'll meet you on a different date, but I'll let you guess as to which is that really special day for all of us in India on when we want to lay out our 101st episode. But today, uh, taking forward the whole theme of uh, Deko Apna Desh, which has been literally, if I may translate it, come see your own country. 
So while the tag is that, it's not just meant for us Indians who live in India, it's meant for all the Indians who live anywhere else in the world, the diaspora as we call them, and all other nationalities and everyone, everyone who knows about India and loves it, everyone who does not know about India and therefore wants to see India, I can assure all of you, you just need to have a glimpse of our incredible country and there is no way you shall not fall in love with it. Because there's so much in our country. If you are a textile lover, there's enough for you. If you're a food lover, ah, you are spoiled for choices. If you are a trekker, there are so many trekking routes. If you're a mountaineer, there are so many mountains. If you are a river enthusiast, we have rafting for you. If you're spiritual and you want to elevate your spirits, there is so much of mysticism and philosophy in our country. I don't even want to talk about it. So there's just so much that it will, there is nothing that is not there for any of you. So do keep watching our episodes as we unroll more. But today we just want to show you a small film of what all have we been doing in these hundred episodes. Viros, could we quickly run through the film, please? That's a beautiful kaleidoscope. And as you saw on the first screen, a huge inspiration came from our Honorable Prime Minister, who in fact, on the 15th August 2019, reached out to everyone in India and said, you know, why don't we Indians start seeing 15 places by 2022? Now, whether it was prophetic because domestic tourism has come to be the mainstay of the industry in the last year and a half, or whether he was just saying it because he wanted all of us to go and see the splendor that's India. And we've been saying in all our episodes, do go and see the world. The world is a beautiful place. But at the same time, do not forget to see within your country because India is large. It has so much to offer. So do travel and see all those places. Now, why I also say that is, and why we drew that inspiration, not just to showcase and come forth with episodes just to show you that, but it also adds so much of economic value. Over the years, as we see how tourism has progressed in India, it is contributing to more than 13% of employment, both direct and indirect. The GDP contribution has grown. The number of people coming to India from overseas has leapfrogged. We are growing at 7% plus of the accumulated average growth rate of inbound tourists. And I'm talking of pre-COVID times, of course, this has been a bit of a blip. But we are looking forward to welcoming our friends back to India really, really soon because the vaccination drive is going on really aggressively. The country has been dealing very with great fortitude and a great amount of support from all the medical fraternity, the doctors, nurses, frontline workers. And so we are getting there and there's a lot of discussion happening and the opening is really not too far. So start planning, start digging into your itineraries and you can also start packing your bags if you really, really want to visit us very soon. We are there, we are waiting for you to arrive. But why I also want to emphasize something very different and that's the reason why we wanted this episode to be specially dedicated to a subject which is not only close to our heart but is an essential subject. And don't get daunted by the topic heading because it seems to take you into as if you're going to talk here a lot about science maybe. No, it's about everyday living. When we talk about what really is carbon neutral, I'm not an expert on it. I am going to get you guys to talk to the three experts that we have today. But why do we need to do that? The more and more viewers, as we are beginning to travel, we are literally adding a footprint on Mother Earth. There have been studies done, not just now, but a few decades back also, where it was felt that the kind of consumption culture that mankind has actually brought itself on, you would need 12 globes to live on. Now, does that not sound so scary? If we look at the whole narrative around and so much of climate change, which is visible, we can see global temperatures rising. We can see so much else happening to Mother Earth. So surely all of us want to live on a very healthy Earth. 
It is important for our own survival that we live in a world that is sustainable. And therefore, while we need to expand our economic activities, but at the same time, how to do them in a more carbon neutral or in a more sustainable and a responsible manner is really, really essential. So therefore, while on one hand, the narrative is yes, travel, yes, build more, yes, go out, see people, et cetera, et cetera, but it cannot be done without at the same time walking the journey of being a very responsible provider as well as a very responsible traveler. So today's session, as we close the 100th episode of these beautiful series brought to all of you, us, we are just a platform, but you guys are the contributors. And so today, also the three contributors, I would like to introduce you, not in any order of priority, but because Atiti Devabhav, and therefore we welcome our outside friends. Before we welcome ourselves, I welcome Professor Joseph Cheer. Uh, welcome, Professor Joseph. You are uh, tuned in with us today from Osaka in Japan, an Australian who has come to live in, Aust in Japan for the last three years. What took him there? A lot of culture and heritage took him there because Japan, also like India, a very ancient civilization and has so much to offer to the world. It's one of the most, uh, I should say, intense and very, very rich civilizations. So, Welcome, Professor Joseph. You are going to be talking to us about sustainability and a lot more. And I'm sure you're also going to tell us that what is it in the last three years that you've learned from Japan? Because there is so much focus on sustainability over there. So, so we would love to hear your views on that. Very much. Next, we have with us uh, Anubhav, Anubhav Jain, who's been working with Airbnb and has uh, over a period of time moved into the arena of sustainability. I guess all thinking minds would naturally tend to do that. Because when you see the amount of wealth, the economic wealth, so to say, being created, the production factors all really well, technology giving us so much advantage and mankind literally propelling the engine of development and progress. But I think at the same time, the word of caution that needs to enter into anyone who respects their environment is essential. And Anubhav, I congratulate you. You're really young, but yet you have picked on the need for the sustainable part of the narrative so early on in your career. So thanks for joining us on this very special episode. And last but not the least, I would say our very own Jaydeep Pansal. Why I say that is because Jaydeep and Paras were one of the earliest ones. I think the second episode perhaps was presented yeah. by them uh, on Ladakh and they took us on a beautiful, absolutely amazing journey of Ladakh virtually. And very recently, we of course went physically also there to Ladakh and saw the efforts that uh, GHE has been doing in that area to begin with. Now they've expanded their footprint uh, to other parts of the country also, Meghalaya, Nagaland, and many other places, on how out of everyday life, you can actually create a lot of socioeconomic and cultural heritage and create a living for yourself while adding value and yet not taking away from the entire ecosystem. So whether this whole world is doomed whether this whole world must necessarily die, we've seen enough of apocalypse, or do we have better paradigms to work on? Is there a demystification as Jaydeep keeps calling it? So I'm gonna call you Jaydeep in first to, to start talking today on this very special episode on what do we really mean? Is it such a technical high jargon word meant only for specialists or how do we really work through this and create a beautiful world for ourselves. Welcome Jaydeep, welcome Joseph and welcome Anubhav. Jaydeep, you go first. Thank you, thank you so much Rupinder ma'am and thank you so much Ministry of Tourism for giving us this opportunity on this very special occasion of the 100th webinar of the Dekho Apna Desh series. I mean, uh, a huge congratulations and a big round of applause to the ministry and to everyone associated with this initiative to take all of the viewers across the length and breadth of India over the 100 episodes and to really inspire the audience to really go out there and to truly see Dekho Apna Desh. India is such a huge country and so many cultures and diversity. I'll just share my screen. Um, and can you view my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So as we talked 
uh, you know, uh, before I get into the whole idea of carbon neutrality and carbon tourism, let me show you what Dekho Apna Desh has really brought to us. It has taken us from the beautiful Dal Lake in Srinagar all the way south to the tea gardens in Kerala. India has so much diversity. You can go all the way to Sikkim to witness the beautiful lush green mountains or go northeast to Meghalaya to crystal clear uh, rivers and lakes where you feel like you're floating above uh, in the air. Or of course, the grandeur of Taj Mahal. Uh, it's a sight to be seen. And then who can forget the forts, the mega forts in Madhya Pradesh? And then the steppe wells of Gujarat. There is so much and the brief intricacies of these places. And then of course, the beautiful temples and places of Rajasthan. And then the clear night skies of Ladakh, which offer such beautiful views. India is not just about its places, but about its cuisines. There is so much to offer, you know, from the North Indian to South Indian to the cultural cuisines that India has to offer, but also the cultures. Now, when you look at the diversity that India has to offer, and when you look at the appetite, people want to travel. All of us, you, me, everyone who's joined this webinar, everyone in our family, friends, everyone wants to travel. They want to explore India and they truly want to see, and as uh, Rupinder Ma'am calls it, Dekho Apna Desh. But then, you know, the idea is, how do you see your world, see India, in a manner that is carbon neutral? and environmental friendly. But more importantly, why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about carbon neutrality? Why are we talking about being environmentally friendly and today's day, days and age? Do you know that travel and tourism contributes to more than 8% of the greenhouse gas emissions globally? And that is a huge contribution. But now if you're wondering, what is a greenhouse gas? Why should I be concerned about it? And how does my travel contribute to the greenhouse gas emissions? Well, to travel to any place, now India is very well connected with flights. It takes one to two hours to reach a totally new destination from the place where you are staying. So you end up taking flights. When you end up taking flights, you're burning a lot of petrol, which produces carbon emissions. Then you, when you visit the destination, you stay in an accommodation. You'll be using a lot of the resources at the destination that you visit in a hotel, in a homestay or any resort that you're staying in. So there are carbon emissions associated with that. And then local travel. It's not like you will go to the destination and just stay in the hotel. You will want to visit the nearby places. For that, you end up taking taxis, which again produce a lot of carbon emissions. And then when you are in the hotels or in these places, there is a lot of food waste. And so uh, food waste also contributes a lot to the carbon emissions because all these release carbon dioxide to the environment. Then of course, there is plastic waste. All of us have seen this. Any new place we go, we need plastic for carrying our uh, supplies. We need plastic water bottles. We end up consuming all these things. And where does this plastic go? In the landfills, in the areas where, you know, it's an open dump yard in most of the places where this plastic just goes. And it sits there for centuries, not for years, but for centuries and centuries. And then all of you must have seen any new tourism destination that you have loved. Uh, maybe you would have gone there 10, 15 years back. It would have been pristine. But now when you go there, there are new hotels coming up. There are new restaurants coming up because all of us, we love to travel. If all of us end up going to a destination, we all need a place to stay. We all need infrastructure. We all need an airport. We all need highways. That results in an infrastructure development, which also causes clearing of forests, clearing of natural land, clearing of farmland to build these infrastructure. So why am I talking about carbon emissions and why are they so important? Well, friends, carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases that absorbs radiation from our earth and prevents heat from escaping into our atmosphere. So imagine if you have a balance where the amount of carbon dioxide that is emitted is also being absorbed, then the global temperature of the earth will remain the same. But now we are in a position where we are emitting a lot of carbon dioxide, as you can see in the graph on the right-hand side, from almost zero tons, it has now gone to more than 35 billion tons plus of carbon emissions across the world. 
as we continue to travel as we continue to uh, build as we continue to grow as a economy india is growing we are going to emit a lot of carbon emissions now what happens with this excess carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere that is going to absorb more heat and it is not allowing it to go to the atmosphere outside when more heat gets trapped it results in a overall temperature increase of our planet which results in extreme weather patterns uh, and of catastrophic changes in our climate but why should i care why should you and i care about carbon emissions well the reason we need to care is because the concentrations are higher than the last 2 million years we are at a tipping point the global surface temperature has increased faster since the 1970 than any 50 period in the last 2000 years it's really increasing at a very fast pace and it is alarming and i'll show you some pictures of what climate change and carbon emissions are causing devastation for our planet the average arctic sea ice has reached its lowest level since the 1850s and human induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes across the globe it is not just that uh, you know india has to do it or the us has to do it or europe has to do it we all collectively need to care about our environment so that we ensure that our planet earth is a sustainable place for our future generations because our future generations are also going to travel but what you don't want them is to travel to a place which is devastated how is climate change impacting our earth it is causing floods and irregular rainfall patterns which is causing a lot of devastation of the nature as well as human life it is causing cyclones and hurricanes you have been hearing about it in the news every now and then there is a cyclone which causes devastation of property of human and of the wildlife and of the nature it is causing a lot of forest fires uh recently in the last 5 years the amount of forest fires has been unprecedented and close to every football field size forest are being burnt every 5 to 10 seconds which is a huge loss of forest cover and forests are important because these trees capture the carbon if these trees are not there to capture the carbon we are emitting more carbon which is not being captured droughts do you want your future generations to go to a beautiful lake and experience this this is not what all of us want and this is a great example of what global warming is doing the same glacier photographed in 1941 and the same glacier photographed in 2004 there is no glacier now and so as the temperature rises the glaciers are melting the sea levels are rising to for the fact that indonesia is now relocating its capital city to another location altogether because they feel their capital is going to uh, go below the sea level in the coming 10 to 20 years so climate change is very much real and the time to act is now because the global temperatures will continue to increase and if we want to limit we need to act and bear in mind that all of us love to travel i love to travel you all love to travel our travel should not be the reason for a planet to be left behind as a unsustainable and an unlivable planet so what should we do should we stop traveling absolutely no we need to travel because it's a desire it's our wish it's a human uh, behavior that we love to explore new places we love to meet new cultures we love to meet new people what should we do then we should focus towards being carbon neutral and what is carbon neutral it means having a balance between the amount of carbon that i am emitting and the carbon that i can take back from the environment let me give you an example if you take a flight from london to new york you it would take an acre of forest to absorb that emission almost an year so that's the amount of carbon emission for a 10 to 12 hour flight it takes the forest an year to take back that carbon so you can imagine how slow the carbon absorption is that means we need to invest in more such resources and ensure that we offset the carbon that comes with our travel so how does it work when you travel you can either work towards uh, purchasing offsets what i mean by offset is by investing in projects which 
uh, set up renewable energy by investing in projects which uh, help in building forest cover by investing in projects that help in restoring our oceans because oceans also capture a lot of carbon emission and all these efforts will help in redu reducing the carbon and create benefit not just for the nature but for people like us as well how do you decarbonize what does it mean and especially for now let's come back to travel industry again if you are in the world of travel and tourism if you are a traveler how do you ensure that your travel ensures that uh, you do not leave behind a negative footprint well there are ways to do it guys and the best part about having a problem is that often you also have the solution with the problem it's just about looking at things in a different lens renewable energy as long as we ensure power up our hotels our resorts our homestays with renewable energy that means we are not uh, we are ensuring that any property that we visit is being run on clean energy and we are not taking up coal or any other non renewable forms of energy for our stay in these places energy efficiency simply replacing all the uh, you know candescent lights with led lights reduces the amount of energy consumption by as much as 90% and that amount of less energy consumption ensures that, that our stay becomes much more sustainable getting into smart buildings and this is something for the hotels and the resorts and the other play people who are who may be watching this but ensuring that you have smart rooms where if the traveler walks out of the room the light switches off automatically you don't have air conditioners running 24/7 reduces the amount of energy consumption and the carbon emissions by 80 to 90%. So there are ways to do this. And then local, eating local, buying local. When you visit a destination, don't try to go for food that is not from that place because when you buy a food that is not from that place, that means it is being transported to that location which causes carbon emissions. But if you visit a destination, if you buy local food, if you buy local produce, that means you are minimizing the carbon footprint of the vegetables of the handicrafts and of any other thing that you purchase at the destination you visit and then of course goes without saying we need to conserve our forest and grow more trees why not every destination that you visit plant a tree leave behind your footprint why can't we do that of course you know check with the local authorities check with the local uh, stakeholders uh, to see if what are the areas where you can freely go plant a tree which can be sustained as well plastic avoid plastic an average travel ends up using 30 single use plastic bottles which go into our rivers our oceans and our landfills what does it take for us to take our own water bottle to take our own uh, refillable water bottle and just use water from the water filters at the destination we visit i mean in our homes guys we do not use water bottles right we don't use uh, kinley or uh, bisleri or any of these we use normal water boiled filter water why can't we do that at the destination we visit and now i will hand it over to professor joseph shear who is joining us from japan to talk about what does it mean to decarbonize tourism and what are the some of the great examples that are working on decarbonizing tourism over to you professor and i'll keep changing the slides for you Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jaydeep, and um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, firstly, um, uh, acknowledgements to Madame Rupinda. Thank you for this wonderful um, series. If this was a cricket match, the hundredth one, we would be raising our bats, right? But uh, let's imagine that we are doing that. Thank you also to Jaydeep uh, Bansal and, and Paras Lumba for inviting me to speak next to you, uh, um, uh, Mr. Anubhav Jain, as well. So. Um, As a, as, a, as an academic, uh, the, those wonderful sentiments that uh, Jaydeep has, has has just articulated, I, I wanted to put some academic kind of uh, framework around it uh, to give some structure to the thinking about decarbonizing tourism, because to be carbon neutral means to decarbonize, right? Uh, one can't be without the other. But it's important to also note that decarbonization is not only a tourism problem; it's a problem of modern lifestyles more than anything, right? Um, so. What does this mean? In the first slide there, um, I've drawn on the work of Professor Susanna Beckin from Griffith University in Australia in relation to what, what decarbonizing tourism means and what are the constraints there are to decarbonizing tourism. Like any concept, it's easy to 
to, to, to talk about it, but how do we put this into practice? Um, and these six, uh, six boxes explain some of the six um, pillars that influence the extent to which we can decarbonize tourism. The first box there is the growth paradigm. You know, uh, global economies, uh, multinational companies, their main remit in life is to grow, right? Is to, uh, a government wants to grow its economy, a business wants to grow its profitability. But in all of this pursuit, we, what we need to understand is um, we need to move away from just growth for growth's sake towards well being. And when we talk about tourism in particular, it has been proven uh, up until the end of 2019 that tourism has grown faster than the rest of the world economy. It also proves Jaideep's point that humans, as humans, we love to travel. Mo mobility means everything for, for us. So the links between tourism growth and increase in higher carbon transportation are clear. There's no denying that. Then the question is, how can growth be rebalanced with other priorities? In my own writing, I talk about social and ecological priorities being just as important because as the pandemic has taught us, what is the point of a good economy if our health and well-being is compromised, right? So the, the second box there is about the institutionalized structures and interests that, that govern the way we can decarbonize or not. There are structures in place, uh, what, what were referred to as the elites, who build a system that promotes their interests and provides little opportunity for alternative views. We see this in the fossil fuels debate, right? Fossil fuels companies are of course interested in continuation of consumption of fossil fuels. Um, and when it comes to tourism, uh, uh, sorry, when it, when it comes to um, uh, um, the, the relationship between um, institutions and decarbonization, we see an inverse relationship between the concept of social dominance and the willingness for environmental action. Um, so um, for, for us as, 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 uh, as tourism industry academics and, and practitioners, this is really important because it's a, it's a barrier that prevents us from decarbonizing. But to decarbonize requires policies that supports, uh, you know, um, uh, um, leading companies like GHE in the fight to, to decarbonize. Who writes the policies and who are the policies for is one of the things that we talk about. We see that um, the pandemic has taught us that if there is global um, um, political will, we can make change. So perhaps it's been, it will give us good examples on how we can decarbonize in tourism. And the inability of decision makers to withstand the lure of um, external pressures continues, right? Um, the, the fourth box, they're about incremental change. We can't change the industry overnight. Decarbonization requires incremental change. We see GHE doing this, and later I will, I will refer to some, some benchmarking examples that do this. So change, but change needs to occur beyond making small change at the edges. At some point, we need to make system changes. Um, otherwise, we get the same, the, the same outcomes. The fifth box there is this idea of unsustainable production and consumption, and J.D. touched on that. We have to, as, as, as consumers, look at how we consume, right? For example, in, in developed countries, there is this concept of degrowth. They say that we must degrow the global economy. But in developing countries, that's, that, that's a there's a different set of issues there. Imagine telling countries that are trying to develop, you must degrow. It's more about proportionate degrowth. It's about developing countries forsaking some of their growth and transferring some of that across. And the last box there is the distribution of tourism. Um, you know, the questions that are asked, is further growth in tourism possible? Is it possible to grow destinations that people are not visiting? For example, in India, is it possible to grow the per periphery without growing the core and without increasing carbon emissions. And this is what GHE um, uh, tries to address in its, in its itineraries. And if we can move to the next slide, please, Jaideep. So how is this change coming about? How does this incremental change happen? We see an organization um, that uh, tourism declares climate emergency because unless we make changes at the local level, we can't expect changes to happen at a global level. So tourism declares a climate emergency wants organizations to acknowledge the, 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 the simple fact that we are undergoing a climate emergency and therefore something needs to be done. We talk about building tourism better and tourism declares a climate emergency, underlines that. In my next slide, um, we see uh, so examples of some organizations who are, who are, who are doing this. Um, James Thornton, the CEO of one of these organizations, organizations says, as an industry, we must look beyond offsetting advocacy 
and administrative green practices to focus on where we can have the most impact, our trips. So if we can make a difference in all of the trips that we have tourists going on, all of those small incremental bits add up, right, over the long term. So there must be a commitment, as, as Tourism Declares Climate Emergency says, by the industry, by governments, and it's only then will consumers follow. In my next slide, uh, another example, you know, um, how, can we, how can we do this in practice? One of the first points is we can replace transportation options on many itineraries to lower carbon alternatives. We can increase the portfolio of walking and cycling based trips in, 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 in itineraries. And secondly, we can reduce the, uh, thirdly, we can reduce the carbon output of trips by looking at our supply chains, looking backwards at our supply chains rather than, rather than not seeing them as part of the solution. Okay, um, and in my next slide, I benchmark one of these examples. So it's not just organizations, it's regions and destinations doing this. This is from New Zealand, and there's a link at the bottom of this slide you might all want to look at. This is the Nelson Tasman region of New Zealand, where as a, as a tourism regional organization, they've said to all of the tourism operators in the, in the region, decarbonization is important. Look at your operations. And the only itineraries we will put together will be itineraries from organizations who have a commitment to decarbonization. Once again, benchmarking further, we look at, in my next slide, we look at this, this idea of how can technology help us? While we all understand that technological solutions are part of the, uh, part of the overall solution, it's not the be all and end all. But this is one small example. You know, it's almost like back to the future. These hybrid airships are the, seem to be the low carbon future of travel. Perhaps this is the way we're going to travel in the future. And in my next slide, we see the aviation industry striving to try and do things differently. And in this case, they, they're trialing uh, um, uh, the use of recycled cooking oil um, on, uh, on, on a Boeing. Of course, a lot of these things are experimental. A lot of th these things might not be able to be done at scale, but they are all incremental things um, that will help us uh, um, towards uh, decarbonizing over the longer run. So with that, I think that's my final slide. Um, I will hand back to uh, Jaydeep or to Anubhav, and then we will yeah. come back with discussion later. Thank you. And so uh, taking off uh, from where Professor Joseph has left us with the examples, let's talk about Palau, the world's first carbon neutral destination. I wish this could have been uh, some destination in India, uh, say, uh, so that we could have probably said it more that India has the world's first carbon neutral destination. But the idea is to inspire and showcase uh, to all of us is that carbon neutral destinations are possible. Carbon neutral travel is possible. And this is Palau. Uh, it's a tidy island nation with uh, the visitors, the travelers are uh, end up becoming five times more than the local people. So it's a, it puts a lot of pressure on the local ecosystem, on the local resources. So what did this island do as a collective? Well, they developed the Palau Pledge. So the children of this small Thailand, tiny island nation, they got together, they discussed that what do they want to do from their island? What do they want tourism to bring to this island? And so they developed this pledge. Uh, it's a beautiful pledge. I would encourage all of you to Google about the Palau Pledge. And every time you go to this place, you get a stamp on your passport with the Palau Pledge, which you have to sign as your commitment to the children and to the citizens of Palau that you will be a responsible traveler. And then from this pledge, which was also endorsed by Leonardo DiCaprio and many other celebrities across the world, they put a ban on single use plastic. So you cannot buy any water bottles. You have to carry your own water bottle, uh, you know, some, something like this. And then you'll have uh, places where you can refill your water. That contributed a huge elimination of plastic waste. Promoting local food. So instead of uh, you know sourcing material from all the other places to this island, they develop homegrown local food, which they serve to the travelers and tourists. There is no plastic Maggie or anything else uh, kind of a thing that they are serving to the travelers. It's local food, which ensures zero carbon emissions from the supply chain. And then importantly, making travelers aware of the carbon emissions. You know, every traveler that visits by signing the Palau Pledge, by making them read through some of the initiatives, the travelers also become aware that I'm visiting a destination where I don't have to follow these three, four practices. I am not allowed to do this. This is not allowed. These are the good uh, practices that I need to follow. And so by making the travelers aware, they are ensuring that all their efforts are being 
reinforced through the travelers as well. And then that ensures that they are able to offset their carbon emissions by investing in renewable energy, by investing in growing forests. So every traveler that comes, the carbon emissions that they produce as part of their roaming around the island and staying in the island, at the end of it, they will get a report that you have emitted, let's say, five kgs of five tons of carbon emissions. And uh, if you invest in a renewable energy project in our island, you will be able to offset that carbon emission. Beautiful way to sort of uh, engage the travelers from the word go to educate them, to follow the best practices locally, to bring everyone together, whether it's the citizens of the Palau, the civil society, the government and the private sector, the tour operators who all follow this. And it's of course a collective approach. Can resorts be carbon neutral? The answer is yes. We have Bukuti Antara, another example of the world's first carbon neutral resort, uh, which is again powered through solar energy. They have local suppliers that are producing all the local food. It's a farm to table strategy that they follow. And they use biodegradable and environmental friendly produce, whether it's the shampoos, the soaps and everything. So guys, the idea is that, you know, all these things are happening in different parts of the world. What does it take for us in India to develop such carbon neutral destinations? And that is where I would like to hand over to Anubhav to talk about how uh, uh, the initiative of Mountain Homestays and GHG is developing carbon neutral homestays in Ladakh. Anubhav, over to you. Thanks, Jadeep. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let me introduce you to the world of carbon neutral homestays. As travel grows, we are seeing more and more travelers now coming to these experiential homestays in exotic locations such as Ladakh. But how do we build these destinations sustainably and what does it take to make these homestays carbon neutral? These homestays have to be powered by renewable energy such as solar. The hot water supplies have to be fed by solar water heaters. Instead of multiple use amenities, we have to go for reusable amenities. We have to have a strong farm to table food strategy. Power these homes by passive solar energy to reduce our dependence on external energy for heating needs and provide water filters for clean drinking water, as Jadeep also mentioned in his earlier uh, presentation. Now let's fly the village named Varshi, which is located right next to the Siachen Glacier. A two home village has a huge potential to become a tourism hotspot. How do we do it in a carbon neutral manner and sustainable manner to ensure that the local ecosystem stays intact? Switch from diesel power to renewable energy. We have seen in remote regions of Ladakh, people use diesel power to power their homes and government has been using diesel power. There are several areas where still diesel generator is a reliance. Remove diesel power and replace it with solar energy. They offer multiple benefits. For the community, it gives 24 seven electricity access. It reduces 0.6 tons of carbon annually per household. Imagine this having going in multiple household. It's very low on maintenance and, deliver, and for the community, it's very convenient. And it has zero dependency on the generator. Traditionally, we've also seen that the community use cow dung or wooden fuels, not only in Ladakh, but across India to heat water, to cook, and so on and so forth. Replace it with solar water heaters. Solar water heaters lead to a carbon reduction of two tons annually per household. So what earlier, if a tourist coming to this destination would have consumed water that would have added to the carbon footprint. But by providing solar water heater, not only the family becomes self-sufficient, but also a tourist coming to this destination does not add to the carbon um, addition, but offsets carbon. We've also seen in the high and rough terrains of Himalayas, the community is reliant on external sources for their food needs and agriculture does not happen there. This leads to carbon emissions of about 132 kgs annually per household. To reduce this, engage, uh, engage greenhouse uh, plants there, put greenhouse. This leads to multiple benefits. One, you have locally grown food, not only for the local community, but also for the travelers coming. So you get tasty organic food when you come to these homestays in Ladakh. Also, the frequent car trips going to the market 
is now vegetables growing in your backyard. What it also contributes is to an experiential uh, thing for the tourists. So earlier, what used to happen is tourists used to come see the destination, but now they're also doing farming in these destinations. So it adds on to the community well-being. You'll be surprised to know only 50% of the lay town is currently connected to a wastewater treatment plant. And these treatment plants are power guzzlers. In Ladakh, traditionally, the Ladakhis have been using dry toilet, which are usually uncomfortable for the travelers. With a little innovation, we have added Western eco dry toilets in these areas. This not only makes these homestays comfortable for the travelers, but it also ensures that they remain sustainable in the long term and they use the local traditional practices. Remove plastic amenities, put reusable options to ensure that the travelers are able to uh, you know, offset carbon print. So, so the landfill which we saw is no more a landfill. Rather, in our experience at GHE, what we have seen is that travelers have actually appreciated these areas for being plastic free and very clean. By using a traditional approach, what would have been five tons of carbon emission, we have reduced it to 140 kgs. So of course, no homestay can become absolutely carbon neutral, but we are trying our best to reduce uh, carbon in these areas. The idea is, can tourism be used as a force of good? Can tourism contribute positively to the environment and the communities? By developing these kind of homestays in these remote regions, we are touching upon 17 UN sustainable goal, goals. So creating clean energy, providing uh, livelihood to these local communities, developing um, areas which are very remote and so on and so forth. So we are building local transformational experiences in these communities in a sustainable and carbon-free manner. Also, these travelers are gaining insights about how do we, how do we uh, live, go in a carbon-free manner and they're they are replicating it for in their next travel as well. Come to Ladakh, experience mountain homestays and your stays with GHE and you would see how a carbon experiential uh, homestay looks like. Uh, thank you, Anubhav. And I think we'll now move to the last segment of this presentation in terms of, uh, so we've heard, we've seen case studies of destinations. We have seen case studies of resorts and homestays, but like, what can you do as a traveler, right? And all of us will agree to this. Be the change you wish to see in the world, as said by Mahatma Gandhi Ji. And I think the change has to happen from ourselves. It has to happen from each one of us as a traveler when we visit these destinations. And what we expect at the destination is what we are going to get. But first, we all need to be aware and understand what is climate change. So after this webinar, we would really encourage all of you to read up about greenhouse emissions. We would encourage you to read about the global warming and the climate change, and then also read up more about what can you do as an individual to uh, sort of really restore the balance of the earth to ensure we leave behind a sustainable planet for our future generations. You have to make sustainable choices. We all have to make sustainable choices. Imagine if all of us, start going to a destination and we say we don't want any plastic give us boiled filtered water if i do it maybe it won't change anything but if all of us do it then the destination the hotels at the destination the truck shops at the destination the tea shops the restaurants they will have to change the way they work because they see that everyone is asking them we need boiled filter water Nobody is buying this plastic water bottle from us. We don't need this plastic water bottle because we need to now invest in a water filter and boil the water and give it to the people. That is the power of collective. If all of us can individually do it, we can make change happen at the destinations. We can make change happen at our hotels, at our resorts, at our uh, you know camping sites, at any big place. Say no to plastic bags. What does it take for you to carry one extra jute or uh, any uh, bag, a paper bag with you in your big suitcase of 15 to 20 kgs. It just hardly weighs anything, but it will eliminate the plastic that you end up consuming at the destination you visit. Please do this. Say no to Maggie tourism. My point is, say no to any tourism activity which involves plastic being used. While this is a great experience, all of us have had it, uh, but 
trust me, the glacier of Khardungla, the Khardung glacier is now in a mess. The, this water is not drinkable from the glacier anymore. There is plastic littered, there are Maggie packets, there are all these plastic spoons and plastic, uh, you know, uh, bowls. This is not what we want to leave behind at the destination, guys. We need to ensure that we stop saying no to any kind of tourism that promotes such activities where you see plastic being generated. Start saying no and remember the power of collective. If all of us can do it, and if we can encourage our friends and families to do it, things will change at the destination also. Try this, try this. Plant a tree at the destination you visit. Leave behind a, your footprint at the destination. And of course, what I'm not saying is just plant a tree in the middle of anywhere and then you know forget about it. But talk to the hotels or talk to the homestays where you're staying. Ask them, I want to plant a tree where it will be maintained. Where can I do that? That's a great way to sort of also take back some of the carbon that you have emitted at the destination. Become a sustainable traveler. Uh, I've taken this photo from Shivya, uh, who I think is also on the webinar. But, uh, you know, we need all of us to be like Shivyas and be like uh, the Anubhavs of the world who really care about their carbon footprint on the destination, who really ensure that they make sustainable choices and who really ensure that they're visiting a destination, they're enjoying a destination, they're enjoying a culture or cuisine does not create a poor or a wrong impact on the destination. Ultimately, please don't leave anything behind, please, but only your footprints. And that's the message that we want to uh, end this webinar with. Uh, and uh, Professor Joseph, if you would like to uh, come in here and just share a couple of things on what do you think the travelers can do before we finally close this and hand it over to Rupinder Man. Okay, um, thank you, Jaydeep. I think you, you, you've, you've painted a very comprehensive picture there. But one of the things that we see in the research on mindful consumption uh, applies to travel. Mind, mindful travel is the other thing. All the, the, the things you say about your, your consumptive habits, what you buy, where you stay, and consumers can, make, uh, can, 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 can be the drivers of a social movement towards decarbonization. So, as they say, it, uh, money talks, right? Uh, and and you've, you've alluded to that, J.D. If consumers make decisions that lead us away towards more decarbonized products and experiences, we can do it. So mindful travel is one of the things that's coming up as a, as a, as a tool. Can industry encourage mindful travel? Of course they can, by providing the kinds of experiences that GHG does. And I, and I see this is where it all comes from in the end. So yeah, so what can travelers do? Um, make decisions, make, um, make consumer decisions that support the very things that are being advocated here. Support organizations that show a commitment to decarbonization rather than organizations who are doing things um, uh, the old way. Support tourism st styles of travel that lead to decarbonization outcomes as well. So perhaps Anubhav, you might want to uh, add to that? Sure. Uh... So you know, making making tourism um, so tourism has a huge scope uh, to be done in a carbon neutral manner, and that's what we are experiencing even in the remote regions of the Himalayas. Uh, so co coming to a destination known as uh, near Pangong, we've seen so many tourists coming uh, in a carbon neutral and carbon, uh, you know just reducing the burden on the environment. And there is also tourism dispersal happening in that area. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is what I have in mind. So uh, if I may now, I think, come in. It's been an amazing, uh, as always, you know, it's shorter than what you want it to be. Because especially when we are talking of subject like carbon neutrality, one would want to talk a lot more. And today I have also taken more uh, time and space because we are uh, celebrating our own um, sense of uh, satisfaction of having brought to you 100 episodes. But the, uh, but the reason why we chose this, and I mentioned it in the beginning also, was that while we've been promoting tourism in the 99 of our episodes, we thought it appropriate that in the 100th one, the need to do so responsibly is a very, very significant, not only underlying, 
but an overarching message which we would like to leave with all providers of services on the supply chain of tourism and hospitality and also all the travelers who travel not just within india but who travel wherever they may go and as uh, jadeep said just leave your footprints so take away memories and take away lovely memories make great friendships and that's uh, i think one of the things that i'm going to ask anubhav uh, more on that and also jadeep that in terms of the home stays apart from the fact that as a traveler as somebody who stays there we experience the local foods local cultures etc etc but how is the reception and how is the welcome and how is the integration with the family from your experience uh, how has it been on uh so talking uh, something about these areas when we send travelers to these beautiful locations in ladakh as mountain homestays and ghe what you have experienced is travelers love the local hospitality they love the local culture they appreciate each element of what they are seeing they do not want to go only to destinations which are uh, popular touristy but really want to experience that what food they eat in ladakh how do they live in ladakh how do they uh, you know what are the traditions of ladakh this is what we have experienced so far and the communities have seen from the community end also we have seen an overwhelming response i think jadi would like to add more to it that you know uh, how things are going in these areas i think uh, for any destination any remote destination for that matter when the community sees that their way of living can create an economic opportunity for them they are very much interested then in uh, sort of uh, bringing such uh, kind of economic opportunities because unfortunately the youth tends to migrate to the cities in uh, in the search of jobs but when they see that there is a possibility to earn income while staying in the villages and which also ensures that the uh, whole uh, idea of sustainable tourism is being advanced through these uh, narratives uh, so both the travel industry as well as for the uh, beneficiaries uh, the homestay owners it creates a win win scenario and for the traveler it's a, i mean ma'am you went there to the homestays you saw that the true culture and cuisine that you and the authenticity that you were there in the village was only to be found in that village it was not to be found in a uh, in a nice hotel in leh absolutely it was a remarkable experience we were we were just there uh, about 3 weeks back and i certainly would not substitute that experience with anything else the the sheer joy with which this service was being done for food the way it was being made with so much love and care that itself added so much to the experience so so clearly this is a beautiful part of an experience building of building memories but how to do so mindfully and it's a very interesting word that professor joseph you have used about mindfulness and i would say it's not only about mindful tourism but it's about mindful living and it takes us to this whole um, concept that as we as humanity are evolving more and more and we've moved over uh, from coming from the stone age to now where digital technology is literally powering the uh, earth and we are out there hunting for more planets and many more living planets etc etc but at the same time how to live mindfully because what is the i think if i may take it to a more philosophical level as to why are we even here on earth and do we own the earth and i think how to do so mindfully while we live here for whatever number of years that we are yes creating economic value leaving things for posterity but how to do so mindfully now my question to you there is that in terms of carrying the actual let's say the the work group so to say forward would you recommend a toolkit would you recommend some very uh, specific kpis that we need to start integrating into our uh, lives as we travel the world that's a question to me miss uh, madam rupinda that's right that's right yeah look i think um um uh, mindfulness in a sense asks us to make deliberate decisions rather than decisions for example consumptive decisions where we buy things that that we that we that we don't need um mindfulness in many ways 
ask us to reflect on everything we do. So what are some, what are some toolkits for us as travelers that we can look at? And I think one of the biggest challenges for us as travelers is being able to get the information that allows us to make informed decisions. You know, we see many, we see the Global Sustainable Tourism Council developing indicators for sustainable tourism. And what you're saying is it's fine to have those indicators for organizations, but how do consumers make decisions? How do they get the information to tell us that one, one uh, travel provider is better than the other when it comes to decarbonizing? And of course, one of the biggest challenges is we see certification and whitewashing or greenwashing. How do consumers see through that? What we need are more solid indicators that, that industry and governments can apply to make industries be transparent with their activities. Otherwise it becomes subject to marketing. So th this is what leaves consumers in a very difficult situation. Most consumers want to make good decisions. The biggest problems is they don't have the, the information to enable them to have the confidence to do that. Would that be right, Jaidi? Absolutely, I mean, uh, very rightly said, it's about, uh, I think, uh, you know, ma'am, you rightly mentioned it. Uh, there needs to be more awareness on this. Uh, there needs to be a more sort of, uh, you know, reinforced thought. So maybe, uh, you know, every time we talk about tourism, there has to be the aspect of uh, the uh, impact of tourism and how that can be circumvented. So any, let's say, going forward, any conference that happens, any uh, B2B meetings that happen, can this be a core part of it that any company that is coming and presenting, can they also show as part of their criteria that how are they uh, sort of giving back to the environment? Can that be a start? Uh, because we need to start somewhere. Because then that gets the thought reinforced in everyone's mind that even, you know, when we go to an event that's organized by the ministry or by any other uh, platform in India, we are going to be asked what is our environmental impact and how are we uh, circumventing it? So I think that's that there has to be a start somewhere. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And uh, I have an input coming in from uh, a very senior officer who's been working in the power sector, Anirudh Kumarji, who says that we can introduce a scheme of star rating for tourism for carbon neutrally, similar that they have for electrical appliances. And he's volunteering to prepare the benchmarks and work on the details since he's done a lot of work on carbon neutrality. So thank you so much, Anirudhji. We would love to take your um, support on this. And uh, Jaydeep, I think we can tie up with him and uh, maybe carry it forward next week and see how we could actually turn it into an, a real-time uh, data which can be collected and people can be encouraged to adopt certain practices. Absolutely. Now that's a great idea. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Anirudhji, for that. We'll definitely take it forward. And in terms of uh, now taking to a, a slightly different dimension, uh, Professor Joseph, since you have, uh, you are born and brought up in Australia, you moved to Japan and you're experiencing a very different culture. My first question to you is that, have you been to India before? Have you been to India? Professor Joseph, you're on mute. Um, Madam Rapinto, I'm sorry about that. No, I have not been to India. I've, I've, over the last two years, I've spoken at virtual conferences in India, but okay. not been in India. The time um, to turn the virtual into the real. As I said, we are going to be opening our country very soon to yes. come from across the world. And we look forward to welcoming you because we are also a very, very ancient and yet a very modern country. So we would love you to experience the the diversity and the sheer intricacies and and why do we call ourselves incredible India? But having said that, uh, my question to you is that in terms of living very close to nature, the Japanese culture, uh, there is a lot to learn from them. And what would you say in your last years if I were to ask you three most significant, most significant everyday life things that you notice in the lives of the Japanese which you would like to share with everyone, which lead to a more sustainable living? Hmm. Yes. Well, look, I, 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 um, I, I'm fortunate to be working with many Japanese colleagues who provide me with that. And when you, when you say uh, the contrast between where I'm from in Australia and Japan, it's quite a very big contrast. As far as what I've noticed in Japan, and you are right, there is a sense of this kind of interrelationship between human and nature. Um, we see it in, in uh, pilgrimage tourism here, similar to what GHE does, where 
the, um, the, the, the element of spirituality, religious, religiosity and nature are all combined into, into many tourism experiences. And I think that's one of the, one of the biggest things. There's a, there's a concept in, 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 in Japan that my colleague um, Kazuo Nakamoto and I talk about, motainai, which is really, it predates sustainability, right? It's about everything we do and not wasting anything. For example, you know, if you, if you, if you have, a, have an animal uh, slaughtered for consumption, everything from the, the, the nose to the tail is consumed and nothing is wasted. Um, but having said that, there are also contradictions with the modern life, right? The big urban cities versus rural areas. But I think one of, the, one of the most important things I see is this kind of renewed interest in, in, in culture, in, in their own culture. Many countries have become westernized very quickly, right? Where we adopt things we see in Hollywood films and we want to be like that. But what I see is a, is a, is a kind of U-turn towards perhaps appreciating your own culture more than constantly looking for validation elsewhere. And I think there are some, these are examples for many, many countries, you know, this kind of decolonization of the mind um, reclaiming your culture uh, and, and your heritage rather than continuing to drift away. And I see that here in Japan. But one of the most outstanding things is the respect for each other, for, for other, the well being of other humans. Many of you would have seen in the last World Cup the Japanese football team playing and lost. But at the end of the match, the Japanese spectators were cleaning up the stadium as a mark of respect to their opponents. And I think that's one of the main things, this kind of respect for each other. Um, and this is the way the pandemic has been handled in Japan, not through harsh lockdowns, but through a trust that individuals will make the right decisions. I have to say as an Australian, it wouldn't work in Australia because the cultural mindset is different. Would it work in India? Perhaps, I'm not so sure. But that's one of the most outstanding things, um, uh, Madame Rupinda, is this kind of respect for each other. Thank you. I think those are, you know, truly uh, very, very insightful, I would say, uh, thoughts about how the Japanese look at life as a whole. And in the meantime, Anirudhji has also mentioned that most of the hotels and resorts and a lot of kitchen waste, which can be used to generate biogas for cooking and heating and other agro slash forest biomaterial, which can be used. And that government also gives a generous subsidy for such biogas plants, I think. We definitely have a lot of homework cut out, uh, Jaydeep, to work uh, with the uh, power guys. But also on the side, I can get, see a question from Minakshi Rawat. She asks that, are wet wipes harmful for the planet? Because many times we tend to use it when we don't get water. Jaydeep, would you like to take that question? Yeah, they are, and Professor Joseph is also nodding in agreement. Yes, they are harmful. Uh, and there are other options. You can go for biodegradable wet wipes. Uh, again, you know, it's about choices that we make, uh, you know, a biodegradable one will cost more uh, for you because it's uh, naturally made or the other option is, you know, to simply uh, make your own sort of soap solution and carry a cloth with you so that you can use it to wipe and clean uh, wherever required. So I think uh, these are again choices uh, that we need to make. Uh, it's like this, you know, I had a baby recently, uh, one year old. Uh, you can either end up using uh, diapers or you can end up using cloth diapers. It's about the sustainable choices that you make. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, just one difference of choice uh, uh, takes, uh, you know, 90 diapers a month away to, let's say, you know, just one uh, cloth that is being washed uh, again and again. So it's about choices that you make. Absolutely. Uh, maybe one last question, because uh, we are, as always, kind of sort of out of time. But Jedi, again, this to you that there is a lot of um, misconception, I should say, having experienced a lot of homestays now, that a homestay wouldn't be, quote unquote, comfortable enough. It may not provide you the experience that you want to have when you travel out of your home. So you don't exactly want to live the way you live every day but you want to experience it differently. What, how would you like to reach out to everybody on that? So I think uh, uh, there is a sort of, uh, I agree, homestays have a sort of a reputation where people think it might not be comfortable. Uh, uh, we don't know what kind of amenities you will get uh, because uh, you end up having an Im image of a hotel room, which you end up comparing this. 
but i think uh, a lot of the state governments in india and kudos to all the uh, state tourism boards and the state governments who are doing a great job in sort of uh, you know changing this image of homestays by investing by providing subsidies to the homestay owners to sort of buy good material good quality material whether it is mattresses whether it is pillows curtains carpets crockery so i think a lot of state governments are doing it a lot of social enterprises are also in this field where we are working with the uh, homestay owners to upgrade the kind of facilities to really make it a boutique homestay i would say uh, where you retain the essence of uh, a cultural village life where you retain the essence of uh, the sort of uh, the local customs and traditions but you do it in a manner that uh, creates a safe space for all of us to go to this homestay and you know stay with all the comforts but in a in a very natural and a pristine environment so i think there is a lot of effort happening to dispel that notion and uh, uh, again to the travelers i can only say that uh, unless you don't uh, experience it please don't believe on the what you say, uh, hear or see um, uh, you know staying in a homestay with the community is one of the best experiences you can get and now uh, more and more people are working towards homestay development across india not just in one state but across india and a kudos to the state governments and to the ministry of tourism as well for really pushing the agenda on homestay tourism yes indeed and uh, i must say we were in post covid times in fact for most people it's been a fantastic discovery that you could so to say work from home but not exactly work from home you can go and live in these amazingly managed homestays they give you beautiful vistas they give you so much love and affection so it's a sense of being home and yet not being home and i think it's such a rewarding experience and as i said earlier you make fantastic friends and also you come back enriched because you've seen how a different family lives how they eat their food and i can see rajiv goel mentioning that regional food is obviously a good uh, promotional take away from today's session indeed absolutely and but that's the beauty of india and that's something we've been saying in all our webinars you were the 100 episodes including today's none of us has done a very structured or a professional work to bring you these episodes they are like home grown food they are just organic they have been developed by the sheer love and sheer passion that all of the presenters have had for their own local areas their own areas of interest a theme a concept something that they really feel about which they wanted to bring out and share with the rest of the world so that's how india is it's all about home grown food so you might have a particular vegetable and I always take the uh, the example of lady finger uh, bindi as we call it in india that you can open 10 different boxes in the lunch time in an office and all 10 may carry bindi on a certain given day but believe me each of them will be made differently and each of them will be so 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 very wonderful to have that's the beauty of homestays you can never get bored of repetition you can never have that standard one look but it yet leaves you very comfortable and the ministry of course as jadeep said is working with the industry and with the pioneers in this field like jadeep who are helping and working and there are so many people like jadeep and anubhav who are working across the country if i started taking names i would really really run out of the time because there are many people who are investing their time their thought their resource in creating homestays which are very professional in terms of the things that you need and yet they keep giving you those very unique experiences that will make each of your travels very very special to remember so don't uh, get daunted by this fact that a homestay is literally just it could be a home that is unstructured no the the authorities take great care in grading them in making sure that there are certain minimum standards which they have to meet in terms of hygiene in terms of the the size of the room in terms of the the cleanliness of the linen in kind of food that is maintained etc etc so so uh, it's a fantastic world to belong to both as a provider as well as as a recipient of that service so so do encourage uh, the locals to do that and enhance your own experience of tourism and travel all across the world not just in india through homestays so it's been a fantastic discussion i of course have a lot of questions still popping in my head but uh, a lot of them coming on my phone on the side but i am afraid we are kind of uh, out of time and as i said earlier 
this time we are not going to call you back next saturday and next saturday we are going to spend some more time uh, deliberating and brainstorming with people like jaydeep anubhav and also joseph you are also a part of the kopna desh now so no exit for you and so we are going to spend some time brainstorming viewers and we welcome your suggestions and ideas on how you would want us to reinvent the way we bring you the experience of our beautiful incredible india so if you have any suggestions do mail to us you can reach us on our um, the mail ids are available on the website so do reach out to any of us and let us know how you would want us to showcase if you have any thoughts but i do want to leave a simple thought here that this platform is meant to be a very very personalized and and a home grown platform so we don't want to get into production here we don't want to do any fancy episode which require me to go to a studio to shoot we sometimes run out of power and then we do all kinds of things we sometimes run out of networks but that's the beauty of it and that's how we would want but within that framework if you have any suggestions on themes concepts how would you want to showcase if any of you want to join us and make a presentation please come forth if there's that little story somewhere behind in one of the lanes in your part of the country where you live in if there's something very interesting a myth that you want to share if there's an art or a craft form that you want to bring forth to the world please use this amazing platform because we certainly don't want this journey to stop and we want to keep showing your beautiful uh, country to the world at large now before i leave one liners from all three of you starting with you professor joseph one last message for everyone uh professor joseph you are on mute that's um thank you um one 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 last thing and and touches on my last comment about caring for other human beings um good travelers are good humans if we care about each other and respect each other we will be able to um um leave the planet in a good condition for the next generation thank you professor mm -hmm. um, anubhav i would like to say to all our um, fraternity and the travelers that next time you make choices make them responsibly and it doesn't take a lot of effort it just takes a small uh, bottle which you can carry to your destination to make the world a better place and make it more sustainable thank you anubhav jerry i just like to say uh, like i say every time dekho apna desh lekin isko pyar se dekho isko nurture karke dekho aur isko aage ki generations ke liye bacha ke rakho thank you that's a very very uh, simple messages coming from all three people and simple but long sustaining messages from everyone so viewers we are going to see you now on as i said a very special day for all of us here not only in india but actually all across the world because we are going to see you on the birth of mahatma gandhi the he is the beacon of peace and he is somebody who in fact very early on was reminding us the value of village economy and so we are going to take you therefore straight on to 2nd of october 2021 where we shall as i said bring to you the kopna desh but maybe in a slightly modified format so we're going to take a break next week we are going to let you go back and recap on all our episodes they are all there as a repository on the ministry of tourism's website as the kopna desh webinars do see them do keep encouraging us and we'll see you back on the 2nd of october which is again a saturday which happens to be the birthday of mahatma gandhi and we'll start with our 101st episode on that very special day thank you viewers for encouraging us joining us thank you all my three co-panelists today and thank you negd for being a fantastic Uh, platform from where we've actually been able to bring these episodes and a big thanks to everyone in the ministry of tourism who has at all points in time been a great support special thanks to all the team members who have been with me in these 100 episodes and as always the tagline that goes dekhiye aur dikhaiye apna sundar atulya bharat so namaste and see you 2nd october 11 am back with a bank <laughs>